please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Mrs. Mayor, if you do the roll call, please. Yes. Just click and wait. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Joe Gittins. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Andy Dejegazinski. Here. Kate Nara, I'm here. Tim Menninger. Here. Colin Triffitt. He is excused. Thank you. Lisa Collins. Here. And Gary Dunlap. Here. Okay, with seven of seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Mm -hmm. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda as published. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Public participation. Is there anyone who w wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. And you're welcome to come to the microphones there. Well, seeing no one rush the microphones, we'll move on then to <laughs> recognition and thank you. Awards presentation to Carrie Burgum, um, Bob Bear. Good evening. Good evening, Bob. Carrie is at the Dells. She has a niece that's playing in the state softball, state all-star softball tournaments, so that's why she's not here. <clears throat> but it was about a year ago that we needed a yearbook advisor, and it worked within our schedule to um, have Miss Burgum do it. I had to twist her arm a little bit. She was not really excited about it, but with her photography skills, and besides foreign language, she, she also has an English degree, so it fit right within um, her skills and, and actually her interests. And here's what happened. Just before we had our Renaissance Assembly in the middle of May, I received from Dave Bellin from Jostens that Carrie Burgum had been awarded the National Yearbook Program of Excellence. In order to get this award, the following had to be met. More than 50% of students were covered in the book three times or more. A distribution location and date entered by December 1st needed to be submitted to Jostens. The school needed to have a 70% buy rate based on the 2012 enrollment. Um, final determination was based on number of copies ordered. And then she also had to reach home to parents at least three times in various methods throughout the school year. Her cover and end sheets needed to be submitted by November 1st for spring delivery to schools. And she met all of the scheduled page deadlines um, for the yearbook. And as Dave put, as you can see, this is no small, small task. And he was at the um, Renaissance Assembly and presented Carrie with an award the day of the assembly. So congratulations to Miss Carrie Burgum, and she is back to do this again next year. <laughs> so when you see her, tell her thanks and congratulations. We tell her the same on behalf of the Board of Education, Bob. We really appreciate it. We see her pictures all the time, and they're wonderful. So thank you very much for sharing, though. Great. Then Holman Middle School eighth grader Diana Murphy presents a check to Mary Fitzpatrick, director of the La Crosse Warming Center. And Mr. Vogler is going to help with that. Mary? Okay, I didn't see her here. Mary, uh, she had said that she was hoping she could be here, but with her job, sometimes things do come up working there. So Diane, come on over here. Um, this was a, a special event for us. Um, Diane came to us, and, and this, this year, um, she kind of had a special connection to the warming center. If she and could turn the other way, just so the folks just... back home get to see her. <laughs> oh. and, and, and with that, she came to us and asked if we could do something to help the warming center out. And so we went back and forth and talked about quite a few different ideas, and um, we came up with an idea of having a Penny Wars with the eighth grade class and we were hoping to raise a little bit of money to help these, uh, this organization out, and 
Diane is going to reveal tonight our grand total and um, just say a little bit about that. So I asked like the whole eighth grade class if we could like have a Penny Wars or whatever and it was for like four days and we raised a thousand dollars as just one eighth grade class and I'm gonna donate it to the warming center and my mom passed away a couple months ago and she used to go to the warming center and I just feel that it, I wanted to get something good out of her passing away so I thought I would just start something to donate to the warming center and if Mary was here but um, <laughs> I would thank her like for the things that she does for that place and for all the um, homeless people and everything it just like means a lot to me that somebody can be so kind and have like eliminate their time to like pay extra attention to people who need help and everything so yeah thank you <laughs> Please know that the school district of Holman is very proud of your efforts and the young lady that you are. And thank you so much for sharing your story and for sharing your good deeds. Thank you. this to Mary at the warming center tomorrow so that she gets this into her hands. Okay, then moving on to reports and discussion. District activities, boys and girls hockey funding, um, Dr. Carlson. At the last board meeting, you remember Mark Engler presenting on this issue and at that time I had even made a comment to the board that most likely we would just be moving forward with the funding plan um, and that the board would not be asked to take action upon further reflection I think it would be appropriate for the board to um, speak on this issue take an act take action on this and so we have put together Mr. Englert has put together an issue paper for you that's in your packet uh, related to the the modifications or changes occurring with the funding for our both boys and girls hockey which he explained last time so this would be something there's nothing in addition to uh, add to his presentation but this would be something that we would be coming back then and asking you to take action at the June 24th board meeting um, so uh, a little uh, change from what uh, uh, we said last time but I think it would be appropriate um, if you have any questions I'd be happy to do my best or at least pass them on to Mr. Engler as we move forward with this but you can expect this to come back at the next board meeting are there any questions or comments I think the only question I had and maybe it's a comment question is that um, as a result of this <coughs> experience or this um, event is there going to be um, by the um, activities department maybe a philosophical discussion about having our co-op uh, agreements be more um, what is the word consistent and similar so that we don't run into this again is there some action going to take place related to that I can't respond specifically if there's a specific action planned I do know that within our sport or activity areas again this is and I think some of you had a question this is not necessarily an issue across different activities as much as this specific issue is addressing an issue within an activity in which both boys and girls participate um, that's what this specifically is addressing um, and I think your question is, a, is an appropriate one I don't have a response as far as a specific plan addressing that other than we are very sensitive and aware especially when it becomes uh, equal opportunities for our students both male and female and that this is one example of addressing an issue we believe needs to be addressed at this time any other questions otherwise it will be under the consent agenda 
Pupil services, physical therapy, contracted services, uh, Mrs. Krakow. Well, and I mentioned to Julie that um, she can stay where she's seated unless there are questions. This is something that is routine, routinely brought to the board. Um, actually, we've done it, it was, last time was three years ago because it's been on a three-year agreement. And so you have it before you. Um, this is, again, for a physical therapy services. We contract these. Um, and we've been working with the same provider for uh, a number of years. And so we are satisfied with that, and we would ask your consideration of approval of this, again, at the June 24th board meeting. If you have questions, Julie would be happy to come on up and respond to those questions. Are there any questions? I think as um, Dr. Carlson had indicated in our weekly um, board packet, this issue and the one that's coming next we've had some discussion about purchase services that the bidding process is very clear about when we purchase items or equipment or those kind of things and that may be um, not so clear on purchased th um, services end of the arena so I think Dr. Carlson is walking to the back, but that is something I think you're going to be studying next year and evaluating and will probably come out of the Finance Committee. Um, so that would move us then to the next um, business services, um, interim business office administrator contracted services, Mr. Clark. Um, as you know, Mr. Austin will be uh, leaving us and to do a, a thorough uh, advertising, recruitment and uh, search um, as well as selection of his replacement, we anticipate it will not be until early September uh, that we'll have uh, a person to fill that position. Um, that's if everything goes as planned. Uh, there is a critical time frame during the summer months regarding audit, uh, annual meeting, uh, annual report filing, as well as a number of other report filings with uh, DPI. Uh, as well as the ongoing operations of the business office. There will also be some transitions related to the employee handbook and activities done in the business office. We feel this is a critical time, uh, a time where we need someone, uh, although not full time, uh, with the expertise to help guide us through those activities. And therefore, you see a recommendation uh, to contract with uh, Baird, Baird's a financial services uh, organization um, that provides these services. We looked at uh, numerous other options uh, and interviewed, did reference checks. I uh, believe that this is the best option for us to pursue uh, for interim uh, business administrator services. Are there any questions? And to again emphasize that we are asking your consideration for approval this evening, so it is on the consent agenda. So are there any questions, Mr. Just Menninger? Two quick questions. What would be the period of this contract? It would start when? Um, the contract would start tomorrow okay. if approved tonight and we have uh, arranged for the contract to go until September 15th um, tomorrow being uh, Jason's already hoping that the board would approve this schedule the meeting uh, with the individual to come down this week so that that person is not coming in completely cold is acquainted with the office where Jason keeps electronic files processes that we use so we've set up a little bit of transition on the front and tail end. And then the second question is, I'm assuming this means Mr. Austin has not changed his mind. <laughs> uh, you'd have to ask him. <laughs> I do have his email address and his new street address. So <laughs> feel free to just contact me if anybody needs it. I just want to, I did communicate to the board uh, over a week ago about really the direction was we were just going to move forward. But I, I do feel that it is appropriate to bring this to you. Uh, but again, ask your consideration for approval this evening. So no other questions? No. And I think the indication is on the position is September 1st they'd like to hire and that would be two weeks um, with the person in place. So then the next item is business services health insurance recommendation. And I would just note that we had a request um, Someone came in late after public participation, and it would be up to the boards. Um, I guess I would look to the board for approval to allow uh, Brenda to speak. She would like to just have her opportunity to speak, or um, if that's okay with everybody, if there's a consensus, she'd like sure. to. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll, we will do that now, Brenda, if you want to come forward and then we'll move into the health insurance and I suspect the two items are related, so. Thank you very much, if members you would of the give school your name board. and address, sorry, Brenda. My name is Brenda Peterson. Um, I wear many hats. I am a parent of children who have gone through and also children who are currently going through the home and school district. Home and resident taxpayer, employee of the home and school district, going on year 18. I'm also the president of the Hope Union for the home and secretaries group. And I'm here tonight um, to talk to the board regarding something that's pretty near and dear to me and I know a lot of people, and it's the matter of health insurance. <clears throat> um, that was one of the key factors that I took my job with the school district of Holman. I had my own business, but I was soon to become a single mother and not growing up with health insurance, that was going to be a priority of what I gave my family and the health insurance that Holman offered its employee was, was outstanding. So I was very happy to be able to give that to my family and also a wage that paid the bills. Um, I participated in Mr. Clark's insurance review committee. We were shown a lot of information. We were shown information regarding what some um, private employers offer their employees for health insurance, also the direction that some of the local school districts have gone with their employee health insurance. Um, we discussed some of the things that were important to employers, some of the things that were important to employees. We realized there were some similar things. Uh, Mr. Clark shared with us the direction towards wellness, um, and that is very important in trying to maintain a, a good staff and, and healthy people and healthy families, and um, he shared that with us. However, Mr. Clark did not share any of the cost information of his health insurance. I attended the personnel and governance committee meeting when he did share that, and unfortunately, I was um, very shocked. It's a significant impact on employees. Um, it's going to change a family out of pocket from 200 to an increase of $1,800, $2,000 for the first year, and that will continue. It has, it's not as large of an impact for employees who have that larger salary, but for a lot of us who have a smaller salary, and I know I am a single paycheck family, it really is going to be a huge impact. I hate to have to decide between feeding my family and getting the medical care. Some of the near or districts um, that were in the comparison that we saw um, also paid a higher percentage of that deduct or the uh, the insurance. They paid a, a bigger portion than we we do. We um, employees pay 20 percent, and and um, the district pays 80. Those school some of the school districts were paying like 87 for the premiums for their um, employees. The other part of this is health insurance for many years was something we had a voice in. It was part of our benefits, part of our negotiation of, of what was our, our, our income and our benefits for families. We had a voice, we made those decisions and it impacted the raises that we received. And now it feels like we don't have a voice. And that really makes me sad because like myself, I know so many other employees realize the situation that the district is in, our families are in those same situations. We would cherish the opportunity to work together and try and find something that would meet in the middle that would provide some cost savings from the district but would not so negatively hit our families and our employees. That's what I'd like to share with the board. Thank you very much for your consideration. 
Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. So then with that, move on to business services. Mr. Clark with health insurance recommendation. Janice. So I'm going to ask uh, Janice Waver from the Insurance Center to join us. She's uh, um, the uh, agent for the health insurance plan and, in fact, all the uh, group insurance benefit plans we have. She was also a um, resource person for the health insurance review committee that Mrs. Peterson uh, referred to. So she's go-to when it comes to technical and uh, data sets. So I think you'll find uh, many of the points that I'm going to present on to be the same ones that uh, Brenda uh, shared. Uh, Brenda's been very helpful to the committee and throughout the process. Um, she talked about the interest she has in this topic and um, unlike some people who are interested in something but don't step forward and do uh, something about it, um, Brenda um, always attended our meetings. Um, last year when we made the changes to the health insurance plan and we had those input and information sessions, Brenda was at uh, every one of those as well. So uh, great sincerity and, and uh, genuineness in what, when she says this is important to her, and she, she's one of those people who does something about it then too. So um, this is the health insurance recommendation that um, um, administratively we're advancing. I need to say that um, the charge to the uh, health insurance review committee uh, was never to develop a specific recommendation was to study the very things that um, uh, were mentioned earlier. Um, these changes are very difficult, and uh, it was our thought that we should make sure to get uh, the input, understand the needs, um, and then develop a recommendation based upon those. But even at the outset, shared directly with the committee and reviewed even by our personnel and governance committee, uh, it was not that group's charge to. Yes. I'm very sorry, Mr. Clark. Thank you. Good, I haven't <laughs> gone too far. Thank you. Um, so just a point of clarification on that. So here is the uh, committee purpose. This was the um, starting point and, and, and the outcome that that group was uh, to pursue. Uh, review and provide feedback on a multiple year direction to improve effectiveness of the group health insurance plan. Uh, the one word in there that I I point out is direction because um, we had some discussion on that at the very beginning. We set a plan, a multiple year plan, and the group said that's too specific. It makes it seem like you're going to be locked in. Can we identify it as a direction, knowing how dynamic health insurance is and how dynamic the needs of employees are? Uh, so that was uh, the one word in that uh, purpose statement that received the most um, discussion. The committee um, completed um, five steps. Um, those are outlined for you here. I, I won't read them to you. I will tell you that I'll be using this outline then to present to you. It's the same outline that was used by that committee. Uh, it's the same format that we'll present to you. I want to note for the board that you had received information in advance. Much of this is the same as what you received. What I have done though is since last week when those materials went out, continue to work on this issue. When you see the background change from white to yellow on the screen, what you're going to find is that's a slide you haven't seen before tonight. And I've tried to identify those and call those out. They are all included in the handout that you have with three slides per page, though. A little bit different than what you received last week. Uh, so we're going to start by verifying uh, the need to take action, which was the first task that the review committee looked at as well. Um, this chart. Uh, illustrates the growth in health insurance premium rates, the family premium rates in the district um, over this 12-year uh, period, 255%, uh, 21% uh, annually uh, on average. You know, the last three years, some changes there. Um, those are changes that came about um, because of actions taken by employee groups, you remember the actions taken by our teachers several years ago to make some changes to the plan? Um, actions taken by other employee groups as well. The administrators, the secretaries group, in fact, was one of those groups that some years ago changed insurance carrier from WA Insurance Trust to WCA. 
And those types of activities are those that have um, affected um, the premium rates that were previously increasing at 20 percent a year. The committee reviewed uh, what's the impact of those premium increases on the net pay of employees. Um, we looked at, uh, this is an example with teachers. I have an example I'll share with you also for custodial maintenance employees. But the committee looked at all groups, looked at secretaries, looked at educational assistants, bus drivers. Who am I leaving out? Custodians? Anyway, w they looked at every group. And uh, what this illustration shows is how a 21% increase for this group. Remember the previous number was an average for all groups. For this group, the rate went up 21% over the time period. The wages went up 3% per year over that time period. And then at the bottom of the page, this is the number we were really chasing. How did the increase in health insurance relative to wages affect how much of my wages were consumed by health insurance premium contributions? And as you can see here, more than doubled, almost three times, went from 5.67% of the employees' wages to 14.27% of the wages, employees' wages were dedicated to a health insurance premium, thereby reducing the take-home pay. The illustration on the right-hand side of the page shows um, for a higher, more highly compensated uh, employee. This was referenced during Mrs. Peterson's that the impact of health insurance premiums for a person in a higher compensation bracket is less. So 2.95% of the wages um, used to go, now 7.85. Again, the doubling, nearly tripling effect, but a lower percentage of the overall wages. Here's the example for the custodial maintenance employee. And this illustrates how larger percentages of income are consumed by premiums uh, when you're wage rate is lesser compared to the cost of health insurance. Uh, as I said, there were a number of examples. There was uh, one example, uh, food service employees, um, which are very part-time employees, limited hours per day, uh, where if I remember correctly, it was nearly 50% of their wages uh, were going to um, the cost of health insurance premiums. That employee, by the way, was happy. Um, because she related that um, her husband is independently employed and they have no access to insurance and their experience prior to having district health insurance uh, was very high premiums and a $10,000 a year deductible to be able to afford it. So uh, it was just uh, interesting for the committee to hear how somebody paying 50% of their premium was happy uh, to be in that position. Um, so that's the impact that the group studied on uh, employees. And then there's the impact on the school district. So in 97, 98 school year, 5.5% uh, of the district's budget uh, was dedicated to uh, health insurance. Uh, by 2008, that had doubled. 10.54% uh, of the district's budget uh, was dedicated to insurance. And uh, Extrapolating that forward, if the same trend continued, if there were no changes, uh, then over 20% of the school district's budget in 2019-20 uh, would be dedicated to uh, health insurance. Um, the rest of the pie is used to meet all other forms of needs in the district. Again, this slide is one now that has a yellow background, so this is uh, new to tonight. Um, and as I'm presenting some information here in the next few slides, we need to understand that the employer cost um, related to health insurance is really a combination of the district's premium contribution and any HRA or HSA contributions. Some employers, including school districts, have moved to that strategy where they use a health reimbursement account or a health savings account <coughs> as a way to reimburse employees for a portion of the out-of-pocket costs they may realize. So that's a real cost of offering a health insurance plan. Other costs 
that could be included in the annual insurance cost would be the employer cost of offering wellness assessments and or coaching activities. You'll see later on in our presentation that we think that's an investment that should be included in our recommendation. $84 per participant is what we're anticipating that <clears throat> annual cost to be. In addition to the HRA plan cost itself, so if you had a $500 HRA contribution, you have to pay fees to administer those, so that is the employees submit for their reimbursements, you have someone overseeing that plan, those cost about $56 per participant. So when you look at the employer's costs, these are examples of the employer's costs that should be considered. As I move forward here and talk about employer costs, I'm going to leave out the other costs. I'm going to only be talking about premium contribution and HRA or HSA contributions. So in this school year, those employees that are on a single plan in West Salem, La Crosse, and on Alaska, and these are the near neighbor school districts that the Health Insurance Review Committee said that they'd ask us to look at. This is what the employer pays annually for health insurance. So you can see West Salem there, about $7,500, $6,871 in La Crosse, and on Alaska, the low at $5,625. And then the average of those near neighbors is listed. That's on a single plan. That's what they're paying in HRA and or premiums, whether that's at 87% or 80%. On Alaska, for example, like us, School District of Holman pays 80%. West Salem and La Crosse, I believe, pay 87.5% uh, premium contribution. So this takes into account the pre uh, contribution rate that Mrs. Peterson was referring to earlier. And you can see here um, the family side of the cost. Um, the order doesn't change, which isn't surprising. There's oftentimes a relationship between the single and the family premium. And then I'll infill here with what Holman's contributions are. Um, on a single plan, our contributions are 7,776. And on a family plan, 17,616. And fitting into this concept of um, uh, current condition, current circumstance, this is information that needs to be shared with the board. How are we paying compared to others? How are we, that, that pie that I showed, how does our pie compare to the pie that other districts might have? Um, Moving to next year, if we assume 15% increases for West Salem and on Alaska, as well as Holman, we don't know that, but some preliminary information is suggesting those are the types of rate increases that might be seen. La Crosse is at zero. That's because theirs is known. They made some pretty dramatic changes to their health insurance plan design to achieve a 0% increase in their premium rates for next year. So if you went back to the previous slide, you'd see the lacrosse numbers exactly the same. And so if we assume those changes, then you can see where next year our premium, our, our annual cost would be compared to the others. So comparing to the average, for example, uh, what is that, $1,500 per employee on single, and comparing to the family plan, uh, 3,800, am I doing that correctly? Approximately uh, more that we pay for um, our insurance plan here in Holman. So that would be information regarding the need to take action. Then the committee moved to, well, what do we really want from our health insurance plan? It's one thing to look at what others are doing, but what do we want? our insurance plan to accomplish for us. And then the other thing that came right on the heels of that was, well, what are the gaps between what we want our plan to do for us and what we're currently accomplishing with our health insurance plan? And this is a summary of those activities. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, the employees and the employer had some very common interests in terms of quality and in terms of cost. Because of the employee's premium contribution, any increase in premium 
has an adverse effect on them and as it does for the district employees were very concerned about out-of-pocket cost employees uh, employer was looking at other costs anything in green on this in the end was evaluated as something we're doing pretty well we're actually achieving what we want our plan to accomplish for us those things that are in red represent those areas where geez uh, maybe things aren't as close to what we want as uh, as we'd like um, there is interesting interplay between these because while we don't want the premium to go up one of the primary strategies used to keep the premiums down is to increase the out-of-pocket cost one of the nice things about a wellness initiative is that not only does it give you healthier employees it reduces the amount of services you have to access and premiums and you'll see later one of the factors that drive premiums is how much you utilize the plan and so this is one reason why wellness you'll see later on is one of those initiatives that we've included I do want to spend just a moment talking about the coverage access and coverage eligibility the first two under quality for employees because that was a little bit confusing for some so coverage access is viewed as a strength by the district and employees because 97 percent 596 of our 615 employees are in fact eligible for district health insurance and so that was viewed as a strength coverage eligibility was viewed as a concern for a couple of reasons first was the affordability of family coverage the second was coverage eligibility for domestic partners going back to coverage eligibility or affordability for family so 67 percent of those employees I mentioned earlier how many are eligible or 411 of our employees are, are um, receiving eligible and receiving 80 percent family health insurance so the largest portion of our employees are getting that benefit but of the remaining employees 47 are choosing 56 percent paid family coverage and that was viewed as a burden that is 44 percent of that premium this gets back to that employee I was talking about that's viewed as a burden for those employees and that's why eligibility you might not think that when you think eligibility that's why eligibility ended up being identified as an area that we could improve on making family coverage more affordable see the issue is not just that they have to pay 44 percent but that our premium so high that they can't afford the premium and that serves as part of the foundation for some of the recommendations we're making as well this I wouldn't ask you to read on the screen uh, because the numbers are small I present this this is the data that I was just referring to the number of employees eligible for each of the types of benefits it's important for you to know that the committee looked at this in detail in fact they sent us back and told us to do more work on this to provide more data because they really wanted to understand what people were eligible for and electing in terms of health insurance and how that plays into what we need to do Janice jump in here if I'm missing I'm trying to uh, make good use of time here um, the next slide that you'll see was developed uh, to um, look at <laughs> what our uh, comparables are I'm sorry that doesn't count against that <laughs> <laughs> against your time I know yeah All right so. So bad karma it's bad karma all right <laughs>
One more time. Haven't, I'm going to just ask that we turn that off because this room's small enough. While it's important that people at home here, uh, that's more distracting. Turn the, unplug that one. Maybe just that one. Yeah, use hers. Mm -hmm. Is this working? Mm -hmm. I think so. Right. So um, this information we've referred a number of times to uh, comparable school districts. Uh, this is again those near neighboring school districts. We did look at private sector um, employers and the plans they have. We set those aside knowing that under the attract and retain, um, at least for our teachers group, we really weren't competing um, with the private sector. Uh, that may be not as valid when it comes to some of our support personnel. Uh, but these were the primary um, comparables that we looked at. And uh, here you see the school district of Holman. Note that we have a PPO plan. This plan allows employees to elect from a broad set of providers um, without incurring any additional out-of-pocket cost. Is that correct? That is correct probably the broadest, most flexible type of um, plan that you can have. On Alaska has a dual choice HMO. On an annual basis, you pick which of the two, either the Gunderson Lutheran or the Mayo Health Systems, which of the two you want to be in, and then you go to that provider. Correct, Janice? Correct. Uh, La Crosse and West Salem have point of service plans. Uh, they're much like a PPO plan although they have three tiers and less flexibility on where you go. Well, I shouldn't say that. You can go where you want, but be prepared to have much higher out-of-pocket costs. And so those are the differences in the plan type. I will mention, you won't see any change recommendations in the plan type, because as you remember, some of those things we scored well in, green, it wasn't a score, were evaluated well on were that we had great flexibility for our employees. They could check, uh, pursue proficient providers. They had flexibility in providers. Uh, so uh, we did not move to a model that replicates any of these. You'll see that later in the recommendation. Um, I'm wondering to the extent to go through this. We currently have a $100 and $200 deductible, and in fact, a $100 for single and $200 maximum out of pocket for employees. This means that in terms of deductibles and coinsurance obligations, uh, the employee will never be asked to spend more than $200 a year on insurance. That's different than the copays that are listed below because copays, even if you reach your maximum out of pocket, are the obligation of the employee. Correct, Janice? Correct. So you can see our plan. It does have some maximum out of pockets if you go out of network, but mm -hmm. I will tell you that our network is so broad, it'd be really hard for somebody to find. It'd be an unusual circumstance when someone went out of network here in the Holman School District. You can see our premium rates, $810 and $1,835, and you can see that we're an 80% paid premium by the employer. Looking at on Alaska then, they have a $500 deductible. The two behind it means up to two of those per household. So really it's $1,000 maximum per family. They have 90% co-pay. That means that 10% of the cost of any visit is paid by the employee. They have a maximum out-of-pocket of, of $1,000, which is 10 times greater than ours, and maximum out-of-pocket for a family of $2,000, 10 times greater than ours. Well, is it really 10 times greater because we're already at 200, so the difference would be 1,800 on the family plan. You can see that they're, they have co-pays a little bit higher than ours on prescription drugs and emergency room, and then you can see the premium that they pay. And so earlier when I showed employer cost, you can imagine that large part of the reason on Alaska is lower than us is because of this premium. They're an 80% pay employer as well. Lacrosse gets a little bit more um, full of numbers there. The reason is we knew at the time we did this what Lacrosse's 2013-14 health insurance plan was going to look like. And so we put it on the screen in red. The black numbers are really the year-on-year com -year comparable to the rest of the school districts here. So they have a $501,000 deductible. They currently have 100% copay. 
they have a $500 maximum out of pocket, a $1,000 um, family. Um, you can see there their prescription drug was a $10 and what they're going to an emergency room. Um, note what they're going to in 13-14, which would be the parallel year to what we would be uh, recommending to you later. Uh, staying with a $500,000 deductible, looking at 90% copay, $2,000 on a single plan, $4,000 on a family plan, maximum out of pocket. That's double what on Alaska has. And then you can see tier two and tier three. These are the deductibles, copays, and out of pocket costs if you go to alternative providers. It's not alternative care type thing, it's just a different provider out of, in different. Uh, tiers of the network. And then you can see their premium rate. We didn't show in red what La Crosse's is going to be next year because it's going to be exactly the same. The changes they made, black to red, were to fix the premium uh, from 2012-13 to 13-14. Now you can see, and this was referred to earlier, they pay 87.4% of the employee's premium. And lastly, West Salem. <clears throat> um, $1,000 and $2,000 uh, deductibles, 90% coinsurance, $1,500 single out of pocket, $3,000 family. Uh, you can see the office visit copays and prescription drug. You can see that under their emergency room visits, it's $100 um, copay, and then the employee pays 90, or pardon me, 10%, the plan pays 90%. Interesting addition here, they have a HRA reimbursement account. So imagine that $1,500 single maximum out of pocket, 500 of that being reimbursed through an HRA plan. Assuming the employee gets to that mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. in their utilization of the plan, the employee doesn't access services, then that reimbursement would not be made. So that really that 1500 could be considered a $1,000 uh, maximum out of pocket. And the same thing with the family. Rather than $3,000, they're eligible for up to $1,000 HRA contribution. You can see the uh, single and family premium rates, and you can see the contribution rates. These things are really important for you to have in your head as a foundation as we start looking, later on look at, what's the employee's cost? Because the employee's cost is the 20 percent or 12.6 percent that they pay in premiums plus the employees cost includes the out-of-pocket cost that is if they access them not everybody but it includes that cost and then those costs would be offset by an HRA contribution so later on when I'm talking about the employees total cost Keep in mind all those components of a plan because they all have an effect, one way or another, increasing or reducing the employee's cost. Sorry to take so long on that one, but we'll be referring to much of that information later. Um, this is uh, referring to the gap we have in premium, the concern we have uh, about premiums and premium cost. There really are um, a number of factors that drive premiums. Uh, there's a list here. Um, the Health Insurance Review Committee was aware of these things that uh, affect premiums, and as we looked at them, uh, in some cases we kind of joked about the fact that uh, we don't want to try to control some of those. Um, the age of the employees or the gender of the employees. Um, there, and all of these, except for the bottom one, are really outside your control. We will not control medical inflation or the introduction of new technology or new treatments. Uh, in health insurance. All those things drive up health insurance. The only one we can really affect is plan utilization. And so the recommendation focuses on plan utilization. In fact, it focuses on plan utilization in the form of wellness programs, which I talked about earlier. One way to reduce utilization, utilization being a factor that drives up premium cost, is to have employees so healthy they don't have to utilize the health insurance plan. Theory being that in the end, 
la reduced utilization will reduce the premium costs and save everybody money. Employee and employer will enjoy lower premiums. The same thing can be said for plan designs that promote thoughtful utilization. Right now, we have a plan that private sector and most other school districts aren't using, and the reason they've gone away from the strategy isn't the immediate premium savings. It's because the plan, when the employee is involved in the immediate financial implications of seeking services, those decisions are made differently than when there is no cost. And uh, that's been, Janice can speak to that, that's been evaluated many times over. Correct. The, when we look at plan designs and plan options, we really look at what uh, type of an impact it is not only to the employer for their portion of the premium, but also from the employee's perspective. And by making some plan modifications, I think it will uh, certainly help improve the utilization, the claims activity that we have currently. With our current plan design with the $100 deductible maximum out of pocket of 100, when we looked at the reports that we received from WCA, that's really equivalent of one office visit. So once an employee or a family member has access to one office visit per year, the rest of their health care for the remainder of the year is paid at 100% with the exception of their co-pays responsibility. So um, I look at it from a perspective, it's a green light to access health care with really not using sometimes good uh, uh, consumer guides as far as where to access care and the frequency of it depending on that individual's medical conditions. And we certainly don't want to stop somebody from accessing care when they have a medical need. We just need to take a uh, look at the utilization reports that we have and make some good decisions on plan modifications that will impact the group as a whole. So if we go back and look for a moment at that slide we just got done reviewing, um, what Janice is saying, what I'm saying is that the lower rates in on Alaska, 38% less, La Crosse, 24% less, West Salem, 21% less, have something to do with the higher deductibles, mm -hmm. but they also are driven by the lower experience rates that occur because of those higher deductibles and co-pays. So um, that was GAP, uh, what we want and what gaps we have between what we want and what we have. Uh, next was to identify strategies to close the gap and uh, also sequence. And so here's the recommendation, the initial recommendation, because there is a modified recommendation that we're going to present to you tonight. The issue paper itself is actually formed on the initial recommendation that was shared with the Personnel Governance Committee and included in your packet. We've since then listened to some of the input that we've received and made a modification that you'll be presented tonight. Look for the yellow background on the screen. So could we just go to that? I mean, if you've got a different sure. modification, let's just go. There, there. it is. Okay. Thank you. We heard that the cost would be too high in that initial year, particularly based upon um, not having time to anticipate it and make financial accommodations for it. So what we did was we took the uh, planned introduction of an HRA reimbursement account in the second year, and we're introducing one half of that in the first year. So it would be $250 on a single, $500 on a family uh, participant. Um, the intent of this is to reduce the personal financial impact to the employee. The district will have to put the money into these HRA reimbursements, um, but it was a response that we developed to some of the input we've received. Um, I'm sorry. So, Jay, can you, yeah. So, on that, then the recommendation continues that you would, in 2014-15, do 500 and 1,000. Correct. And then in 15-16, there would be the additional. I know that's kind of cut off, but the employer HRA employer contribution, the second level down there of 500 and 1,000, in addition to that 
that portion of it would stay it could stay with the employee the first two years it would is that a use it or lose it I don't know how much time to spend on these but since you offer an opportunity I will spend some time on the HRA so the HRA reimbursement which is the top row of HRAs uh, really is a reimbursement the employee has to incur the expense if they incur the expense then the reimbursement is made no re no expense no reimbursement um, the lower part is titled an HRA employer contribution we're scheduled to introduce that in 1516 and we're delaying the implementation of that because the wellness initiatives we're going to implement in the first two years are designed to promote wellness behaviors in the third year you start meeting healthy lifestyle standards and you'd qualify for the $500 single $1,000 per family and that go into an account whether you incur medical expenses or not the idea being if they We've, we've got these people ramped up so that they're so healthy that they don't incur medical costs. If you make it a reimbursement type, they're never going to access it. it you're, you're, you're avoiding the very thing you're trying to incentivize. So when you do that type of program, then you have to move to an HRA plan that goes into the account whether you access or not. Um, this is a sheet that you've seen before. There are some things that are highlighted in yellow, so I won't go through this all. This would this is a 15-minute presentation. I will highlight those things that are in yellow, which you may not have heard uh, previously. Um, we would change one of the benefits in the plan, the chiropractic benefit, currently uh, from 100%. Um, Janice, maybe you can explain this. Sure. What? Oops. Uh, we propose changing the chiropractic benefit right now after the deductible has been met chiropractic services are paid at 100% and when we looked at the reports on utilization they give us what the actual school districts members are utilizing for each different uh, type of service versus the norm with uh, United Healthcare and the chiropractic benefit for the school district is 240% above the norm uh, so we felt that there was a need to make a plan modification to start trying to have people be better consumers of some of their care. So the recommendation would be for the chiropractic benefit versus being paid at 100% to implement an office visit copay for that service. So we would implement a $25 uh, office visit copay for in-network and out-of-network chiropractic services. It doesn't represent any type of a change in premium. And the, the carrier, when I spoke to them in great length about this, feels it's necessary to make this change to help control future utilization and premium differentials because of the high utilization that we have currently in this particular category. Um, the other things that are highlighted on uh, this page, uh, in year one, uh, when we presented to the Personnel and Governance Committee and the materials the board had, we talked about the $20,000 of funding available through the WCAA insurance plan. And the question was, what are you going to do with those dollars? And we've identified here then some specifics. Gym membership reimbursements, we introduced that program this year. We'd make it a year-round activity uh, in the upcoming year, again, along the lines of the wellness weight loss programs uh, available to employees, education on chronic disease uh, within the district, uh, and smoking cessation programs. Those would be some of the uh, educational and incentives that we'd provide uh, paid by the district. Well, actually by the grant. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, those types of things continue in year three, so they were highlighted there uh, in year three. I think that really represents the only changes um, that we made to that document. Uh, earlier I said we needed to talk about the employee cost and what's the impact of these changes on the employee cost. Remember I talked about the premium amount being a factor. The premium contribution rate, 20% versus 12.6% for other employees. The maximum out of pocket. Remember that we're going to include the full maximum out of pocket even though we realize a good number of employees will not meet uh, the $1,000 and $2,000 deductible or maximum out-of-pocket we're talking about. 
uh, and then the HRA contribution. We did not complete, include in this comparison the uh, co-pays, and these vary so much by participant and what uh, they access that we didn't know what number would, how many co-pays would you use in this uh, comparison? So um, if we look at the employee cost this year in the plan that we have, the employee cost on a single plan, all those things considered, their premium contributions based on our rate, um, the maximum out-of-pocket cost, those things I just shared, this is the cost incurred by the employee to have health insurance coverage. The next set of numbers, numbers in blue, will represent what if we had implemented the changes we're talking about for next year in this year. What would the cost of employees have been then? I'm doing it this way because when you start talking about next year, then you're talking about getting the rate increase involved in there as well as the effects of the plan changes. I really want to isolate on the effect of the plan change, not what's going to happen with rate increases next year. And that's the impact to employees. So their premium contributions would go down because the recommendations being advanced reduced the premium by 8.9%. So their premium costs would go down, but their out-of-pocket cost goes up, and then we offset a part of that with the HRA. So this is kind of the net effect of the changes being advanced. I take out what's the change going to be in the increase for next year, because that's going to happen no matter what you decide premium rate increase for next year, nothing done, would happen. So here we're focusing on the recommendation is to make changes to the plan. What's the impact of that? And so there you have it. There was some talk about the cost impact being $1,800. That's calculated by only focusing on the maximum out of pocket and not recognizing uh, an HRA contribution, which people didn't know about, or the reduced premium cost. Which was, it, well, we didn't have an HRA. That's what I'm saying, right, yeah. tonight. So how could you include right. that? You didn't even know it was part of the proposal. So the rationale for the changes is to uh, control long-term premium costs. That's the plan design changes and improve long-term affordability for employees, which gets at that eligibility issue. I can't help but mention that we'd have a hard time meeting the affordability test with our current plan under the Affordable Care Act because it's such a high premium cost plan. Um, improves eligibility um, by keeping premiums more affordable. Um, we are recommending the addition of the domestic partners coverage. Uh, and we're preserving some of those things that uh, were identified as important. Convenient access to providers, uh, proficient providers, employees can select and go where they would like as opposed to an HMO plan. Um, we think these are the things, when we look at those near neighbors that allow us to continue to attract and retain employees, it is a change from what they have now, but comparatively, I think we can still attract and retain. Um, we think the wellness programs will help to um, perpetuate what are really low absenteeism rates in our district and um, maintain highly productive employees. Timelines and sequence, that was the last thing on the list. So here's what is laid out for you. I think most critical is where are we tonight? Where are we tonight? That's June 10th, you're reviewing. Be looking for board approval on June 24th. Employees would be notified of an open enrollment period for the health and dental insurance plan. We'd have new plan documents available. You have to have those prepared so that when you present open enrollment, the employees know open enrollment in what. Um, and then uh, at the same time, we'd roll out flexible spending account information because it is important with the additional out-of-pocket costs for the employees to be able to use the flexible spending account to get those dollars on a pre-tax basis. And uh, so we want to, that's why we had a delay in our flexible spending account this summer so that we could preserve the opportunity for employees to exercise some choices here. 
And um, there you have it. Then August 5th and 9th would be enrollment in Flex. August 1st to 31st would be the open enrollment in the health uh, and dental plans. This is really focusing on the health. And then the renewal is on September 1st. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I, that is a lot of time. But this is a very, very important issue. And uh, so you need to, as you move forward on making a decision, have all the information that we can present you with. So thank you. Yes, and thank you for presenting that information. And um, I think hearing some of the comments that had been raised and some of the concerns and responding to it, I guess um, whether you know that is uh, adequate, I think we'll have some conversation here as a board. We asked Jay to come forward and bring this to us so that we can discuss this. If there are any other further changes that we want to see, um, we would certainly have him research some of those so looking for comments discussion Jay, will we get what you presented the changes in a printed form that we can read because the font yeah. is so tiny dr carlson and i talked about that today and um what we'd like to do is it's not just the school board but it's the employees who should have access to all that information so what we'd like to do is uh as quickly as possible tomorrow get it all posted um, this is how we did it with the um, last year's input and information sessions. We just posted all the information. Um, so we're going to try to get that done tomorrow. I don't, we haven't talked about is there a link on the bottom of the home page right next to the employee handbook so it's easy to find or we, we haven't talked about those things but and for, for you Anita members, we can send one right to you. But uh, And in addition for board members we'll get this can still working on it even this afternoon so didn't have a chance to get it on the Dropbox but those of you utilizing the Dropbox will be doing that as well uh, tomorrow morning so other questions comments um, I have a question just a clarification question so what was presented tonight I do need to absorb I need to look <clears throat> at this and study it further but I'm understanding that choices have been made right now um, for a plan that's going forth that is recommended is that correct and then the sheets that are going to come out that we saw tonight and employees will get tomorrow or the day after or whatever the economic impact that'll be spelled out for them well as it I, is in this I, I just got that correct though. I mean there has been there have been some choices made that you're wanting us to consider yes so I should look at those choices right thank you and then and then at the same time that we saw them tonight and other employees will see them tomorrow we'll all digest that and have input and then um, what are the avenues that employees have input or will your committee I'm sorry I forget <coughs> health name. insurance review committee thank you does that committee reconvene when it does have this information and then there'll be more um, discussion of that or is there not a reconvening of that committee there is not a scheduled reconvening of that committee that committee was not charged with developing a recommendation um, but the, all the good work that they did uh, to this point in time so we won't really know what employees think about this right? oh or, um, or I, I, some of the changes that we've advanced are because employees have so employees it, I'll, my experience has been it doesn't take a committee to get employee input. <laughs> um, yeah, in fact, we have received some uh, uh, employee input, and um, uh, Brenda will tell you that uh, the Health Insurance Ooh. Review Committee was very active in communicating with employees. After each of our three meetings, we put together a summary of what happened, and we sent it out to employees, and we asked them for input. Now, the input was lean at that point in time, and maybe that's our human nature that um, until something when the economic impact yeah. comes out I'm expecting there might be some yeah. input or reaction yeah. and I'm just asking that because um, that's just information for myself as a board member also mm -hmm. um, cost effectiveness for a district is a big thing but then are there choices that employees have for helping with cost impact I mean what would would they rather do a or B 
doesn't mean we vote that way or not, but it's just more information yeah. for me. Yeah. And I would be really interested in something. No, we don't need a committee for that, but there's also a difference in reaching out to employees to say, so what do you think? And um, I think that's a good thing to do. We're all on the same side, and I'd want to know eventually we, what they think. Kate, those are great points. We had 12 members on that committee. Not everybody could attend every meeting, but did that, those 12 represent the whole? And I always know that when I get calls that it may not represent the whole either. Right. Um, so we tried to do a good job of understanding what the needs were, what were the most important components, what we were doing well. Could we have missed? <clears throat> we could have missed. Maybe yes. people would say, go to an HMO. This is crazy. Right. And I also know that some districts um, have um, surveyed their members to see, would you rather A or B or C? And so already, before you make a plan, you kind of know what's important to people. Because we represent so many different people. We represent people who, some of these figures that are going up, I know that's such a huge percentage of their paycheck. And they're paycheck to paycheck. They're basically in poverty, some of our people, or working a second job. So it's an important vote to look at increases. That, that's all I'm saying. And for me to help empathize with who my people are as a board member is really so important to me. It's really so important to me. It's way different than someone who makes a really high paycheck compared to someone who's working from paycheck to paycheck. And I just feel like as a voting member, I need to hear what they have to say. Nobody's going to say they want costs to go up, but I wonder if they'd have viewpoints of choices in columns that they'd be willing to pay more for. That's all. Any other comments, questions? <clears throat> I was going to make him nod around a little, yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate all the work you guys did, and I understand what you're saying about reducing the uh, out of pocket. And if I understand it right, uh, to Brenda's point, she's paying eighteen hundred dollars maximum, maximum out of pocket. That would be the increase from a two hundred dollar maximum out of pocket to a two thousand. Your proposal, you have uh, the fund. If she, if they, if they approach that eighteen hundred dollars, they get five hundred dollars refund back. So it takes it down to thirteen hundred. The third year, they get five hundred dollars, an additional five hundred dollars, right? And that takes it down to. No, an additional two fifty. <laughs> they get five hundred. Yeah. Well, well no, but I'm keep sorry. track of other changes that are happening in the plan as reason. you move to those later years, because we're looking at changes uh, to uh, co-pays at different tiers of benefits. Um, so there, th there's a number of factors that are interplaying. I did not do the calculation in all the future years, and honestly, we're not tonight asking the board to approve the future years. No. Uh, we're I trying to give sure. an idea of where they're going. We won't on the 24th be asking the board to approve the multiple years. Employees said, we'd like to know where it's going in the future rather than each June or July or even May <laughs> telling us, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. So, well, Mr. Turned. Dunlap, I think your um, numbers, uh, the 1,800, you subtracted the 500, 1,300, right. but there was also a projected the savings, the cost savings, I think what I, uh, in the presentation, 300, 350, something like that, that would be uh, in that 900 dollars. some dollar uh, estimated yeah. cost. Right. Yeah, that gets at that slide that I was presenting that says the net impact of this to the employees on a family plan is about $900. $900 is a lot of money. Oh, we've been talking about it for a long time that uh, private sector and the public sector as you can see by the other school districts can't we can't continue to follow the ramp that we're following with insurance insurance rates are going to continue to go up 15 or 20 percent something has to be done uh, they can't maintain that type of it takes bigger and bigger chunk of the budget all the time um, and unfortunately it's not if it was something we control it would be different but it's something that we that we can't control it's but the insurance business itself we're trying to make it as a little as least painful as we can uh, to each employee but understand that the not only the school district employees but the private sector 
and every one of us on the board that work other places are, are going through the same type of thing. So I know that doesn't make you feel much better, <laughs> but it's true. Um, and I like the idea that Jake and Dr. Carlson came back with a plan to, to reimburse you another $500 off the top to, to help reduce that pain, but unfortunately it's going to be painful for everyone, I think. Other comments, questions? I just believe you also said that some of this is going to be driven by the Affordable Care Act affordability standards that are coming down the road as well that's going to have an impact for some of those older traditional type of plans that are almost going to force some changes with some of that to mm -hmm. stay with the Affordable Care Act too that's coming down the road. I can't yeah. believe that, and I'm, I'm not a soothsayer, but I can't believe that afford, the Affordable Care Act is going to come through and insurance rates are going to stay close. I would expect insurance rates to go up exponentially from 15% to 20, 25% if, when that gets implemented. It's going to be scary for everyone. We'll get through it together, I guess. Anyone else? Um, I, I just, I wanted to thank Brenda because I know it's, um, it, it takes a lot to go up and speak um, on behalf of quite a few people, I would imagine. And I appreciate you coming to the Personnel and Governance Committee and giving us your input. Um, when I look at these figures, uh, when I, in three years to go from a maximum out of pocket of $200 to $5,000 for a single parent um, who's probably at the very low end of the salary scale in the school district, I wish I had a magic wand. I wish I, I wish I had an easy answer. I think that putting money in the HRA is a step in the right direction, but I, I don't know how we can ask someone to choose between eating and going to the doctor. And I understand, Janet, what you said about um, the higher deductible means less doctor visits and it equals a lower premium, and that makes total sense to me. But to make uh, doctor visits and that higher deductible out of reach for a family it, there's a fine line between totally out of reach and and using that higher deductible as a tool to help drive co health care costs down but making it out of reach and driving someone um, to the poorhouse or to not seek medical care when they might need it and they have kids who need it it just leaves me scratching my head I don't know I don't know what to do, but I agree with Kate that I w I'd like to hear, like Brenda said, they may have some answers they'd like to give input and see if they can come up with some suggestions. You know, I don't have an answer. Um, I wish I did. I just know that it's awfully hard to, to say, yeah, it looks like a great plan for somebody to go from 200 to $2,000 in one year. I can't do that. So I need time to digest this, and I would like to look over the figures and the papers when we get them to. Can I add just a, something, too, if yep. you don't mind? The, when we look at the, we're looking at the maximum out-of-pocket numbers is, I know, worst-case scenario. And actuarial, every plan that we look at over the number of years I've been in this industry, mm -hmm. it's 20% typically of the membership actually are utilizing the plan on an ongoing basis. The other 80% use it either for wellness or an occasional illness or injury. So those are unpredictable. Um, we do have the plan designed with the office visit copay, which means that they only have to pay the 20 or 25 at the time of service versus having to reach the deductible or maximum out of pocket. So we try to accommodate that. With the average office visit in La Crosse being $158, the members are either going to be paying 20 or 25, and that doesn't make any difference if it's a primary or a specialist, which are usually three to four times that. The wellness component of the plan, meaning if they go in for their annual preventative care and wellness, does not apply towards a copay or deductible that's paid at 100%. So we don't want to discourage people from accessing care. We do truly want them to have their wellness because we hopefully, if there is something going on, we can catch in the early stages before it becomes such a, a chronic disease. We also have the uh, direct contract with the neighborhood family clinics, uh, which are sponsored by Dr. Ted Thompson. And we have a special contract. If they go to any of his clinic facilities, everything is paid at 100%. There's no office visit copay, no deductible or coinsurance. So we're trying to provide choices so that uh, for affordability as well, um, but also taking in consideration how 
everything is going to either be an impact on the employer group or for the employees. So we certainly understand both sides of it. Thank you. You know what, I, I heard you say it, maybe I missed it, but what percent of uh, a population of insured people like ours would get close to the $1,800 or $2,000? Well, I don't know that number exactly, Gary, but looking at the reports that we received, just in one particular category kind of pinpoints where the utilization is, and it's under what we call chronic disease impact. And of that number, 17% of the membership fall into that category, and there are six different medical conditions in that category. And of that, that represents 40% of our total claims. So in that area, when we talk about education, that's an area where we certainly need to focus on educating employees that are in that component, and that means that that 17% are utilizing one of the six chronic, it could be more. And one particular category where we've talked about is the high blood pressure. We have one point, just over, just under $1.2 million in claims that are just in that one particular category. So maybe a change in activities as far as maybe some wellness incentives that focus on that particular chronic disease would certainly help us. So you, the actuarial studies typically show about 20% of the total membership are what dries up your cost, and this pretty well kind of confirms that. Any other questions? Lisa, did you? You're looking at me like you wanted well, to I say mean, something? I think the biggest thing that um, impacted me was obviously the single parent, low income, high cost, and wanting to be able to come to the table and kind of talk and give some feedback about that. I guess that, that was the thing that kind of um, spoke to me the most. Okay, great. Well, and, and I agree. I, I look at the review committee form that you did with the red things identified in red, and I think you look at cost, and when you talk about lowest premium and lowest out of pocket, those two things are really kind of opposite of each other, and it's, so it's hard. And I suspected, I suspect that if you had presented that committee with those numbers and given them maybe an opportunity to prioritize, you maybe would have, you know, not had the reaction we did initially to what your proposal was because, out of, you know, the lowest out of pocket versus lowest premium, I mean, there is an interest by the district, obviously, to keep the premium low, but I think for the employee, there's also an interest there, but they kind of are in opposite. Mm -hmm. They are. Yeah, contradiction, yeah. or they contradict each other to have that happen. So um, I did some, I asked, I think Jay, I don't know if you completed that, but I, I asked for the impact just on that family. I just wanted to take one number because we could be here forever. The impact of that out of pocket, the worst case scenario, and it ranges from 13% of our average, of, if you take the associations and take their average salary, some associations that could potentially impact their salary, 13%, that 1800 is 13%, to all the way down to 2% of their salary. And someone made the comment that depending on what level of, of um, income you have, it may, that $1,800 may be seen at a different, mm -hmm. having a different impact. And so even if one of our employees is being, you know, impacted so negatively, I think we have to consider that and take a look at that. The options that you give for some of those clinics, I think, uh, thank you, because not everyone would do that. I do appreciate your um, looking into the um, HSA, HRA, whatever those things are called, earlier because I couldn't understand the initial proposal to start immediately and the, instead of working our way slower. And some districts I've seen them at, you know, even doing it even more slowly. But I think we had originally heard that there's a potential for our premiums to go up 20%. And I think right now you're estimating 15. And were you estimating with this change a lower percentage with these changes? Right, it would be about 9%. The 15 would be offset by the, pardon me. The 15 would be is if nothing changed. The 15 if nothing changed, it's about 9% the changes that we're having, so it'd be about a 6% increase. If the 15% holds to be true. And even though you did share for us the, um, 
what the impact would be of the current contract. If you have that number, if you're able to estimate that number, I still would be interested in seeing if no changes took place, so, and we saw a 15% increase in premium, but we didn't change anything. What would the impact be to the employee and okay. to the district? Okay. And then versus what is the impact going to be based on your 9% increase, but yet increase in out of pocket if you're following me? And Again, both. so really then we look at the impact, for, the premium increase for next year is going to happen. Right, regardless. but whether it happens at 15 or at 9. Right, the question is, on, yeah. 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 Gotcha. I just would be curious so that I really know what the potential impact is going to be and I think of doing nothing or of doing what you're recommending. Yeah, I think those that numbers can take into account their right. estimates, but those numbers can be generated. That'd be good. Yeah. So if there are anything else that you would like to see? And then, yeah, I, you know, it's like buying an automobile. You could say, well, what kind of automobile would you like? Oh, you'd like this, and you'd like air, and you'd like this. But then you get the sticker shock, and sometimes in retrospect, then you have to go back. And I wish we would have had an opportunity to do that with employees, to say, well, these are the priorities. These are the things you've identified as your priorities and things of interest, but this is what it's going to cost. And there might have been a different discussion. Well, we had, we had, mm -hmm. we had. 20 years of negotiations where they stated through negotiations what was important to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should know what's important to them by what they negotiated and what they wanted and what they didn't want in the contract language. And that should have indicated to us what was important and what was important. And I think we have that history. We, should, we can't ignore that, I don't think. Right. I just think with giving them partial information and not giving them the full thing and the numbers, I think it, you know, the the numbers well, are I important. Think too, I agree, Gary. You know, for a long time, insurance rates were at a certain rate, and employees made choices for for things. But in the last just five years, things have changed drastically. So new choices, I think, are made by most reasonable employees. And, and um, it might be a different scene than it was maybe 15 years ago or 20 years ago because um, of the skyrocketing rates. You know, yeah, they are skyrocketing. You have to remember too that that as a board, um, that if we if we spend that much more on health care, that it's going to have to come from someplace. If, if if we have to, if do we want we do we want to make the choice of raising uh, student teacher ratio by two students in order to fund this, or you know, or cut something else, cut the raise off, or it has to come from somewhere. Just keep yeah. that in mind. Mm -hmm. One last comment because I've heard the reference a couple of times. Um, we did tell the Health Insurance Review Committee and the employees in the district as a whole that we were going to move to a plan comparable to these other districts and did share with the Health Insurance Review Committee what the out-of-pocket costs were to these. So the arithmetic of going from a $200 family deductible to a $2,000. While it wasn't put together in the detailed presentation here, the Health Insurance Review Committee was told that. As far as what's happening with the other school districts? They knew what was happening with the other school districts, and we told them that the plan would include moving towards comparable plans. So. Yes, I didn't lay out in front of them. Here, let me let me quantify that for you. Two thousand dollars, two hundred dollars. Here's the difference. Um, but they were told that. So I, I, we didn't walk away from the meeting saying, well, "Okay, thank you. We'll go do something." Uh, we, we we outlined what the wellness would be, what the um, premium and costs would be. Thank you. Okay, so we will be getting some more information and um, continue to look at this. It will be on the next agenda, uh, or the agenda for our next meeting. And reports and discussion are next. I would call upon the board members in the order of the roll call, ask them to present any committee reports or comments that they have. Mr. Gittins. I'm going to let Mr. 
John will have to take care of our finance. All right. <laughs> Um, Mrs. You. Jay Gazinski. Um, I have nothing at this time. Okay, Mrs. Mayor. Oh, yeah. um, I did report to West Salem the um, annual convention of um, uh, school board CISA. members. Yes, exactly, CISA. Uh, we had a guest speaker, Laura, I think it's pronounced Pinsone, I'm not sure, um, who, who, who gave a lengthy presentation on I think what our school board knows about already. It was about report card, and we're so well informed on that that I thought to myself, we're either really well informed <laughs> or, you know, ahead of the game or whatever. So that was the biggest part of things. Officers were um, elected. I do have the <coughs> annual report if anybody's interested in that. I can also give you a website that you can access that if you'd like the information on that. Um, but other than that, that's all I have. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Menninger. Just a couple of things this evening. First off, as I look at uh, agenda item 9.3, I do notice that there are only three more school board meetings <laughs> between now and the start of football practice. Oh, stop. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> really? Summertime. Um, I also wanted to just talk about something that's been in the news in the state quite a bit lately, and that is the uh, school vouchers. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just mention for the record that I am a 12-year uh, attendee of private schools graduated from a private high school and uh, I, I, I have as a graduate I, I have some concerns about the voucher program not only are they taking dollars <coughs> away from uh, you know our tax dollars for private schools you know they uh, um, do have an effect of having an impact on the public schools budget uh, you know they uh, are not subject to the same standard scrutinization and oversight that the public schools are but there's also something else that I think we might be missing in this discussion and that although here in this area we have some very fine private schools. But what's to say that a new school that isn't started that's a private school maybe doesn't follow our same beliefs or core values? And your tax dollars now w could potentially be going to those schools as well. And when you look at us here on the school board, we are a public body. We are elected by the officials, so in a sense, the taxpayers do have control over how we spend those dollars. But that control would now be going away because you would have really no oversight into how those dollars are spent. So with that, um, I, I obviously am, am strongly in opposed to any expansion of the school voucher program in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, as a, a private school graduate, I am opposed to expansion of the private school vouchers in Wisconsin. Thank you, Mr. Menninger. Mrs. Collins. Um, I just wanted to report that I did end up going to um, Academy on the Prairie to visit their open house, um, and it was awesome. It was um, really neat. I had gotten one of the student um, guided tours and had a chance to speak with about three or four of the students just by myself and sat down and talked about um, their experience there and where they started and you know seem to be graduating some of them and um, how much progress they've made because they were able to have uh, a situation for learning that really accommodated their needs it was amazing and um, yeah I've got some people that I've been to, I'm a social worker at the county and so I've been um, talking about some of the neat things that I've been learning about the uh, Academy on the Prairie and so um, I think there's some other folks that are real interested in looking at their, that program for their kids. Thank you very much. I'm glad you made it out. I don't know if any other, I know Dr. Carlson was out there, but Joe was there. Oh, Joe was, okay. Well, see, Joe, you could have reported on that. Well, I think I figured the new <laughs> Someone. Right now is much better. I'm but, not a talker. I'm but, gr you know, it's great. I appreciate it because, you know, people, I'm glad you were able to make it, but I could have never made it, but I really want to be out there because it's a great program. I think so now that the subject has been brought up, we, Would you like to share something? Some? That we were, were asked to share, and that was Please. the sign for that old school should be torn down, and the mm -hmm. sign for the new school should be put up. So that was what we were both asked to do, and I presented it to Dale, and Dale is going to look into it. Yeah, we really should look at look at that, and then I think it. You know, I know that it's not. We have a philosophy um, for our. Um, police liaison officer but I think we have some issues with that person being able to be out there because it's not in the village and so those are some things that oh, point, I yeah. know that it's county. yeah it's the yeah. town of Onalaska oh. and so it can't 
Yeah. I mean, law enforcement, they're saying law right. enforcement jurisdiction. Right, it's more that our police be... liaison is who is supposed to be in the classroom and doing mm -hmm. positive things with students, encouraging that relationship. They can't really travel out there because it's yeah. out of their jurisdiction. We should maybe have a police liais liaison from the county sheriff's department. That won't happen. <laughs> we, we, we have visited with uh, Officer Hickey, and, and again, uh, there are opportunities to make him available at least for educational purposes and so on to work with and he is more than willing to do that but yeah ultimate jurisdiction uh, does not lie within the village um mr dunlap i was going to speak for joe but obviously he can <laughs> speak for himself over there <laughs> so to, on the insurance issue i'd just like to let everyone know that uh, I feel the same pain that, that you all feel in my own job, and I hope we can do something to help. I'm sure we can we can work something out. Uh, we had a, a very exciting finance committee meeting tonight before this meeting, and uh, um, we were saying goodbye to Jason. was was very sad, and we had a cake and alcohol and stuff. It was really nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, that's against the policies. Oh, <laughs> I mean, we we didn't do that. And then uh, we be <laughs> and in the finance committee meeting, we began working in earnest on the 2013-2014 budget and uh, got some baseline numbers down for that. Um, I want to thank the, uh, Mr. Vogler and and Dr. Carlson for the great uh, eighth grade celebration. Um, that's a great class coming into high school, and it's going to be a lot of fun and. Uh, Mr. Bear is going to have his hands full of that group. I think it's a it's a nice group, and it's one of your first grandchild coming into your high school. So good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I'd like to remember remind the public that uh, even though schools are closed, there's lots of activities going on in the schools in and around the schools with basketball camps and so on. So drive carefully and uh, watch out for our students all summer. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunlap. I just have a couple things. Um, new committees will take effect to July 1st, and I will get those to Christina um, or Dr. Carlson this week. I have had a couple conversations with folks, so those are ready to go. The community collaboration is continuing to see progress. Um, we've been meeting, uh, we will be meeting, continue to meet. Um, we have another subcommittee this week, and then next week I think we have tomorrow. We, do we have that? Subcommittee. Yeah, there's a subcommittee on the site evaluation, and then um, the, the larger committee. It's really great to see the village of Holman and the town of Onalaska, the town of Holland, um, and the school district, and then those three movers and shakers, um, <laughs> Lori. Um, and Mary Lynn and um, Dan McHugh come together and kind of lead us. We've got some folks from Viterbo that are assisting us with um, trying to bring those groups that aren't necessarily used to working together together and finding some consensus. And, and um, we've got a case statement and those kind of things and trying and making sure that we continue to focus on the students. So that's a positive. I will say that um, unfortunately, I am concerned a little bit about the, some of the discussions by the, the village related to the TIF districts. And we had been involved in that committee a few years ago, and the TIF district that is currently exists north of us, um, initially it was supposed to be mostly commercial and that kind of um, development with um, residential development really targeted to come toward the end of it and the it's moving through the village right now that there's a, it sounds like a project of someone who I know and really like he's the developer um, but it's primarily residential which in a TIF district the school district will receive the value of taxes on the day that it became a TIF district but so we supported that because of all the commercial um, improvements that we thought might happen. So that in, because with the commercial, you're not going to see the students. However, if they have residential coming first, then there's a potential to see students um, coming and we will still receive that same value. So it's just a concern when you see that in the paper. And then also there's a new, newly um, being established TIF district that they're, they're talking about as well. 
So, um, I, you know, we really probably need to have a conversation with the village about that and just share our concerns so that they can be, I know they need to, in order to establish a new TIF district, have a representative from the school district on their committee, and, and I would just share that depending on um, the timing of their meetings, I might peg one of the board members to be a uh, member on that committee, and so we'll have to have that discussion. So that is all I have. Um, moving on to board meeting schedule as Tim said we've got three meetings before August the June 24th July 8th July 22nd and so at those upcoming board meetings on August 26th we have our annual meeting so we begin that evening with a regular board meeting which runs from 6 to 7 then from 7 to 8 we have our budget hearing and then from 8 or after 8 we do our annual meeting and so as that approaches um, if you have any questions, I know Lisa, if you have any questions on that since it, you, it will be your first time, feel free to reach out to Dr. Carlson or myself. We can answer questions for you. So next item is consent agenda items. Are there any items at this time that you would like to have pulled out and considered separately? Seeing none, then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Not a discussion, but it, it's just always with sadness to see all the resignations. But uh, I noticed Mr. Wolpat on there as well. I know mm -hmm. he's come before the board several times, and um, certainly mm -hmm. sad to see all those, but especially someone who's been a, a good advocate and come before the board on numerous occasions. Yeah, I would concur. Any other comments or discussion, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then executive session. Mrs. Mayor? Yes. Be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin statute 19.851C for the purpose of reviewing base wage negotiations. Is there a second? Is there a second of oh, Mr. Gittins? Okay, then the roll call. Um, Mr. Gittins? Yes. Ms. Hancock? Yes. Ms. Jagosinski? I will not be here. But, yes, Mrs. Jagosinski okay. has to excuse herself. Myself, yes. Um, Mr. Menninger? Mr. Menninger? Yes. Mr. Menninger? Ms. Collins? And yes. Mr. Dunlap. Okay. We will go into executive session in five minutes.